Okay, um, I think we're going to get started with the uh, second of four Invasive Crayfish Collaborative webinars. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Um, so I'm Greg Hitzroth. Uh, I'm an Aquatic Invasive Species Outreach Specialist with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and Illinois Natural History Survey, and I'm going to be moderating the session today. Uh, this educational series is meant to address invasive crayfish topics that have been identified to be of interest to collaborative participants. Uh, this is being funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, today, we're talking about the development of chemical control strategies for invasive crayfish. Uh, so some recent studies from laboratory to field. Uh, and it's, today's webinar is presented by Ann Allert, uh, Dr. Jim Steckel, and Aaron Cup. Um, the presenters will be taking questions at the end of all the presentations. Uh, you can submit questions during the presentation through typing them in the, the chat function, or there's also a, a question function, I believe. So if you type in a question, just make sure that you are addressing the uh, the question to uh, the right presenter. Uh, so type in Ann if you want a question for Ann, for example. Um, okay, so with that, I'd like to introduce our first presenter today, uh, which is Ann Allert. Um, Anne is a uh, research fisheries biologist at the U.S. Geological Survey in Columbia Environmental Research Center. Ms. Allard has worked on the effects of historical and current lead mining practices on crayfish in Missouri and surrounding states, and the development of chemical control tools for invasive crayfish. Uh, she has a BS from Michigan State University and an MS from University of Missouri. And with that, I'll leave it to Anne. Do that. Well, hello, and whether it's at the beginning, middle, or end of your morning, thank you for joining the webinar today that is focusing on recent studies developing chemical control tools for invasive crayfish. I'd like to recognize again my co authors or co investigators and co presenters, Aaron and Cup and Dr. Jim Steckel. We'd like to acknowledge our funding sources our partners and staff who helped conduct our research. Dr. Kim Fredericks was the principal investigator on our laboratory carbon dioxide tri trials. We'd also like to thank the Invasive Crayfish Collaborative for the opportunity to discuss our research this morning. Our research is focused on assisting the Michigan Department of Natural Resources or DNR. DNR managers are seeking methods to include in an integrated pest management plan or IPM to control yeah. or yes sorry uh, we can't see your slides huh all right sorry um, that's unfortunate because I can see them <laughs> all right let's go back Thank you, Greg. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can see it now, thank you. Okay, so here are our funding uh, sources, our partners, and our, the staff that's helped with the study. And again, we're looking at trying to develop control methods for red swamp crayfish in Michigan. Uh, there are currently 35 water bodies in Michigan that are uh, infested with red swamp crayfish and they're primarily localized down in southeast Michigan. Chemical control may be a potent tool for the IPM, however, however regulatory requirements, site-specific conditions, species life history and sensitivities all will impact the su successful deployment of chemical treatments. Michigan DNR is providing management overview for the project. And because the inf this infestation is recent, managers are le would like control methods to be deployed in an accelerated timeframe. We're using a structured decision-making process to identify the types of research best suited to achieve a short turnaround time for the deployment and de development and deployment of chemical control tools. Our research is using laboratory trials, mesocosms, artificial test systems, as well as pilot field studies to inform best management practices. The, practice, the process has been quite fluid with many feedback loops to the constantly informing the managers. 
There's also a need for regulatory authority with any intended use of chemicals. As Greg mentioned, our webinar is divided into three parts today. The first part will set a framework for chemical control methods and deployment, provide a summary of regulations that, provide, that govern the use of chemicals in the United States, and present the results of our laboratory studies. Jim will discuss PON studies that were designed to evaluate best management practices for the deployment of CO2 in, at infestation sites. And finally, Aaron will discuss the development and execution of our pilot study in one of the retention ponds in Southeast Michigan. Previous studies that have used pesticides to control crayfish have used chemical formulations, which are mixtures containing technical material or pure pesticide. These mixtures contain both active ingredient or AI and other ingredients such as solvents and carriers. Comparison of data from studies using different formulations, even if the formulations are applied at the same AI concentration can be difficult because other ingredients found in the mixtures may be more or less toxic to the target organism or more or less effective in delivering the AI. Translating data from the laboratory to field-based applications can also be difficult due to the inherent differences from what somewhat sterile set settings in the laboratory and the complex matrix of the environment. Laboratory studies indicate that pesticides are toxic to crayfish at concentrations two to three orders of magnitude lower than those found in field studies. Additionally, species sensitivities to formulations may vary widely or slightly, so we can't assume a crayfish is a crayfish when it comes to their response to any chemical treatment. Potential factors influencing toxicity include species genera and age or size of crayfish. The intended use or any risk associated with that use must be well understood to obtain a national registration for a chemical. Important federal statutes providing regulatory authority and guidance for the use of pesticides in the US are FRIPRA and NEPA. Potential regulatory hurdles for a label for invasive crayfish control include the possible need for chemicals to be registered for each type of use say one targeting pathways of introduction, such as hatchery trucks, or for those to control infestations and retention ponds. Chemical registrants may be willing to share their registration for new label registrations. However, it is likely that new data for ecological risk assessments will be needed. The time and expense to conduct registration trials may limit or prevent national registration for any one chemical for the inclusion into generalized IPM plans. There are currently no chemicals registered for in the US for the control of invasive species, crayfish species. However, emergency exemptions and experimental use permits have been issued on a case-by-case -case basis to control invasive crayfish populations or infestations. Because the main infestation in Michigan is found in small non-water bodies of the state, these types of permits are good options for attaining permitting to apply the chemical protocols. Michigan DNR has requested that we develop methods for two goals, lethal control or low or no detect detection, and the enhancement of other control methods such as trapping or biological control. The chemicals being invest investigated in our study include are carbon dioxide and two pesticide formulations containing cypermethrin and pyrethrin. Newer classes of pesticides, including the botanical pyrethrins and the synthetic pyrethroids, may provide crayfish control as well as a sufficient margin of safety for non-target species. These chemicals have relatively short half-lives of three weeks to three months. However, they are still highly toxic. For lethal chemical control development, we tested two crayfish species, the red swamp crayfish and grilled crayfish, the two chemicals at two temperatures and in two water qualities to determine potential effects to non-target organisms, determine the best time of year to treat ponds, and determine whether site-specific conditions such as turbidity would change the efficacy of the formulations. Both formulations used have other ingredients known to be toxic to aquatic organisms. Since size of crayfish impact response to pesticides, the size of a crayfish were similar for both species 
and size to be the least sensitive life stage. Our assessment endpoint was uh, a 24-hour, 100% lethal concentration. Our data analysis is preliminary, but it would appear that temperature and turbidity may affect uh, treatment results. When we look at percent mortality at the two temperatures for both pyrethrin and cypermethrin, we can see that there are more higher concentrations are required to achieve the same result for pyrethrin than cypermethrin. The potency of the chemicals are reduced at, higher, at, lower, at lower temperatures. Turbidity may slightly enhance chemical treatment and red swamp crayfish may be slightly more sensitive than viral crayfish to the formulation. We're using this data to plan our field trial next year. We conducted three types of CO2 trials, avoidance trials in, in shuttle boxes, incline or emergence trials, again in the shuttle box, except a ramp was placed in the uh, the boxes so crayfish could emerge out of the water, and loss of equilibrium trials in buckets. We again tested two temperatures as well as different life conditions. In these trials, we tested red swamp crayfish and rusty crayfish, and there was a little bit larger size difference between the two species tested. For our CO2 avoidance trial, there were no differences found for light conditions during the deterrence trials. However, temperature had a significant effect on how much CO2 was needed to induce the final shuttle for both species. Higher concentrations of CO2 were required at warmer temperatures and significantly more CO2 was needed to induce last shuttle for red swamp crayfish than rusty crayfish at both temperatures. The concentrations of CO2 at last shuttle for red swamp crayfish was between about 150 and 200 milligrams per liter. For our uh, emergence test, we only tested red swamp crayfish at the warmer, in the water, warmer waters. No red swamp crayfish emerged during, in our baseline conditions. However, all but one of the crayfish emerged in the CO2 injected water. Eight of the nine crayfish moved out of the water repeatedly. They, they left the water five, uh, on average five times in the 30 minute trial. They just did not want to be in that water. And the mean maximum concentration of CO2 at a time of emergence was about 400 milligrams per liter. Our CO2 loss of equilibrium trials were um, conducted at both temperatures and we saw a little bit different response um, than in our deterrence trials. More CO2 was required um, in our cold water to cause loss of equilibrium for both species and rusty crayfish required more CO2 than red swamp crayfish. The average concentration of uh, uh, causing LOE was somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 milligrams per liter, which is slightly larger or higher than what is typically seen in fish. Jim and Aaron will now describe how we use laboratory CO2 data to move into field trials. We are plan planning field trials for pesticide treatment for both open water and borough populations of red swamp crayfish. Previous studies have shown that on land application of pesticides can kill crayfish. However, however, no protocol has been established for the use of pesticides in burrows. The use of the artificial bur burrows at Alburn should allow us to better understand and develop methods for chemical applications on soil. We will also be testing the use of dry ice in artificial burrows. Dry ice is currently registered for the control of rats, which also live in burrows. Therefore, it may be an effect it may be effective in controlling crayfish in burrows. Thank you for your attention, and I'll turn the webinar over to Jim. Okay. So, our next presenter is Dr. Jim Steckel. Uh, 
Dr. Seckel is an associate professor in the schools of fisheries, aquaculture, and aquatic sciences at Auburn University, Alabama. Dr. Seckel's research program focuses on ecology, physiology of native and invasive crayfish, with a special emphasis on burrow and species. Dr. Seckel has an MS from Ohio State University and a PhD from Miami University. All right, thanks, Greg. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me, but I think everything is showing up. So thanks everybody for, uh, for coming here today and listening to uh, us talk about our research. And ho hopefully you'll hear something useful and interesting today. So I'm gonna talk about some carbon dioxide pond trials um, that we did down at Auburn. And here I'd like to acknowledge um, my postdoc, Hisham Abdulrahman, and my graduate student, Rebecca Tucker, who um, actually were responsible for conducting most of these trials that I'll talk about today. So we had a, a couple main research questions. The first one was whether or not we can use carbon dioxide to cause crayfish to emerge from, uh, rather than in a lab, for in, uh, to emerge from semi-natural habitats. We were using ponds as our um, test units. We wanted to determine what proportion of the pond population emerged from those ponds? And then what is the, the best way to collect them uh, as they emerged? And we were also interested in looking at uh, suboptimal and optimal conditions for this. And two of the main things that we were concerned with were uh, the presence of freshwater inflows that might create refuge conditions in the ponds. And then also the effect of temperature, because obviously it's a, a lot warmer down here in Alabama than uh, up in Michigan uh, during most times. So we conducted these trials in 14 meter square earthen ponds at our fisheries research station. We used carbon dioxide tanks and diffusers to introduce the carbon dioxide into the center of the pond at the deepest point. And we installed fencing barrier <clears throat> around the pond so that we could keep the crayfish within a restricted area for uh, easy collection after emergence. We stake the fencing to the ground uh, to try to form a good seal. And then we place pitfall traps in the corners of the fencing. So um, about 30 minutes before the carbon dioxide tanks were turned on, we added 100 crayfish to the pond. So for the rest of the study, just keep that in mind, we're always starting off with 100 crayfish. So if I have 20 crayfish come out of the pond, that means uh, that's equivalent to a 20% capture of that population. We allowed crayfish to emerge for about seven hours. And um, we collected, during the initial trials, we collected emerged crayfish hourly, hourly from the pitfall traps. And then also uh, every hour we collected any animals that were just wandering between the pond edge and that fencing. And we weren't sure if the pitfall traps would work. Uh, this video is kind of cool. It shows that it actually did. Uh, you can see this crayfish here. It's kind of wandering along the fence edge. And comes right up to that bucket. And has no hesitation at all. <laughs> it goes, goes right in. So that was kind of a nice surprise that, that those actually did seem to work. Um, this graph here shows pH on the y-axis against time during that, that first trial. So here we're actually using pH as a proxy for carbon dioxide because when we did the first trials, we didn't have our, our carbon dioxide titration kits or probes in yet. So we, we couldn't measure carbon dioxide directly for this trial, but we were able to monitor pH. And you can see that in the control pond, the pH stayed uh, constant at about 6.5 throughout the entire trial. But in our treatment pond, the uh, pH declined pretty quickly and then leveled out at about 5.5 for the remainder of the trial. When we looked at crayfish emergence, so these were crayfish that were either wandering next to the fence or had fallen into the pitfall trap, um, we graphed cumulative crayfish emergence on the y-axis against time. And in the control pond, you could see that we only collected one or two crayfish during that entire trial. But in the carbon dioxide pond, they started to come out of the pond uh, pretty regularly. And so by the end of that seven hour trial, we had collected approximately 50 crayfish. Um, 
the majority of those were collected wandering between the fence and the pond and 12, only 12 of those actually fell within those pitfall traps. So this was pretty encouraging, but we did have some concerns for applying this in a real world situation. So for example, that hourly, hourly collection was a big time investment. So these were pretty small ponds um, and it was still a little bit tough to get everything done every hour. And you can imagine in a bigger infested pond, it would, uh, as Aaron will talk about after this, it was an even bigger time investment. The other issue was that even though those pitfall traps worked, uh, we would have had to install a lot of pitfall traps to efficiently collect those crayfish. And it just does not seem practical to install enough pitfall traps along the perimeter of a, of a uh, large pond. And it would have been difficult even with these smaller ponds. And also, um, it was really not practical or possible to pin that fence down to the ground to form a complete seal or a good barrier with no gaps. So the crayfish would often wander along that fence line and they would always find a gap and get under the fence and then sometimes escape to the other side of the fence. So, so this was the real value of conducting this, these preliminary trials as we started to see some of the, the problems with this technique. So uh, we decided to kind of use these weaknesses as a strength in terms of the fence. We noticed that a lot of the crayfish would actually seek shelter under the fence and so we wanted to see if we could use that fence in the place of pitfall traps. So instead of staking them to the bottom, we actually um, had a lot of excess fencing for these next trials at, at the lower end and folded those. So we had about, we had two to three one foot folds at the bottom of the fan, at the fences. And we wanted to see if the crayfish would use uh, these folds or even get under the folds and use that fencing as a shelter. And then we wanted to determine the proportion of that population we could collect under the fence with only a single final collection rather than those hourly collections. And then also, because this now no longer was a barrier, we wanted to see how many would escape past the fence. Because you can imagine if, if we're causing crayfish to emerge from a pond and all they're doing is, is going out past that fence and maybe getting into other waterways, this may not be a, a great idea for crayfish control. So this next trial, we set up two replicate ponds. We put, uh, we injected CO2 into both ponds, uh, presumably at, we tried to keep it at a, an equal rate. And by this time we were able to measure carbon dioxide directly. And so this graph shows carbon dioxide on the Y axis against time on the X axis. And you can see that the carbon dioxide levels were elevated in both of these replicate ponds. Uh, initially, the levels in pond two were lower than pond one, but that evened out by the end of the experiment. We allowed crayfish to emerge undisturbed and collected them under the fencing after seven hours of exposure to the CO2 in both ponds. And the crayfish that escaped past the fence were collected hourly because we, we considered this to be an escapement and this was a, not a desirable effect. So um, when we looked at the results for pond one, we found that 57% of the population was captured. Uh, 53 of those crayfish were uh, under the fence at the end of the trial, and only four crayfish had actually escaped and moved beyond on the fence. We considered this a pretty big success. This was really encouraging. Um, however, when we looked at pond two, which should have behaved in the same way, we, uh, we only collected 6% of that population. So there were only three crayfish under the fence at the end of the trial and three additional crayfish had escaped beyond that fence. So this pond obviously would have been considered a failure. And so we wanted to know why we had such different results between these two ponds. During the trial, we had noticed that even though carbon dioxide reached that target level, we were not seeing crayfish wandering actively around the pond edge just like we usually do in ponds when CO2 has been put in. So in most of our experimental ponds, once we start injecting that CO2, you can see those crayfish. They're very active. They're coming up to the edge of the pond, wandering around the primitive, perimeter of the pond very actively. But we didn't see this um, in pond two. It actually looked a lot more like a control pond where we didn't see any crayfish at all. So they were not observed near the water's edge. When we drained that pond, we found that 
what had happened was um, these ponds all have an, have a catch basin in the middle and they have an underwater inflow that we used to fill the ponds. And uh, I'm not going to mention any names here, but somebody had forgotten to uh, completely close that inflow valve in that, in that pond. And so the whole time during this trial, we had a slow, steady influx of fresh water coming into that pond. So what we actually were doing was accidentally simulating the presence of an underwater spring. And this was creating a refuge, just a small refuge at the bottom of the pond, right in the deepest part uh, down in the center. And those crayfish were actually sheltering in that carbon dioxide refuge um, and, and uh, staying there for the duration of, of the trial and they did not emerge. And at the end of the trial, we were able to get all of those collected close to 100% of the crayfish all in that uh, refuge area. So in summary, um, carbon dioxide did show promise as a control agent in the absence of a freshwater refuge. So when there was no freshwater refuge, it seemed to work pretty good. So if we could get the pH down to about 5.5 or carbon dioxide to about 200 to 300 milligrams per liter, it, we were able to collect about 50% of the crayfish within seven hours. So, more, so about half of the population came out of the pond and just um, went right to that fencing stayed under that shelter for easy collection with minimal escapement. So this was great. This worked a lot better than we thought it would, but we did still have some concerns. And so uh, we were a little bit leery of, of temperature effects. So again, these trials were conducted down in August in Alabama. So it was very hot. The water temperatures were 30 to 38 degrees Celsius. So extremely warm. And so we, uh, subsequent to this, uh, and this was after we conducted the, um, the field trials that Aaron's gonna talk about next, we conducted additional trials at cooler temperatures and we saw a pretty dramatic change. So when the water temperature was high, above 30 degrees, we could capture about 50% of the crayfish that came out of the pond. So it was very effective and those crayfish would stay under the fence when it was sunny and it was hot. But once the temperatures cooled down, and especially when we had some cloudy days, uh, we noticed that the crayfish, would, they would tend to go to the shelter and then they would go back in the water again, and they might come back out and then they would go back. So they did a lot more wandering. And so when we collected at the end of a trial, there actually were not, uh, except for in this case, there was usually a lower proportion of crayfish that were collected under the fence, which is this light gray area. And as opposed to the trials during the hot temperatures, even by the end of the study, we were collecting a lot of animals that were just wandering between the water and the fence. We think that they were just coming out, going right back again and making collection a lot more difficult. So the next question then was how to improve capture rates at more reasonable temperatures that are less than 30 degrees, because this is what uh, y'all would be experiencing a lot in Illinois or in Michigan or in a lot of these other um, invaded areas. And so uh, we wanted to look at two things. We wanted to see, we did notice that we got a lot of crayfish that would come up to the water's edge. A lot of times they would turn on their side and start air breathing a little bit. And so we wanted to see how much we could increase our capture efficiency by also collecting crayfish that did not emerge, but were right at that water's edge and were easily collected. And we wanted to see also what would happen if we went back to hourly instead of just a single final collection. So we used a randomized complete block design. Um, during each trial, we had three ponds. One was a no carbon dioxide control, uh, Another pond we collected hourly, and then a third pond we collected crayfish only at the very end. We're still conducting these trials. So far, we've we've conducted three of three of these, and so I'll show you the results of of these three trials summarized now. So, if we only collected the emerged crayfish at these cooler temperatures, so we just left the ones at the water's edge alone. You can see number of crayfish collected on the y-axis and then our three pond types on the x-axis. And again, the, because we've only gotten three trials so far, the statistics are a little bit uh, weak, but you can see the 
the control, um, we had a borderline significant decrease in the number of crayfish collected, which is what we would expect, because hardly any crayfish came out of the controls. But we did still, we still got some crayfish coming out of the ponds at these cooler temperatures. But regardless of whether we did hourly collections or final collections, we still had captured less than 20% of that population. So, so that was uh, a big decrease over our 50% collections that we had seen in hot temperatures. If we collected the emerged crayfish and we went around and collected all of the crayfish that were near shore, we showed a lot, a lot of improvement. So in this case, we uh, were able to increase our removal from less than 20% to about 30 to 40%. So a pretty significant increase, but it was still under that 50% goal that we had seen at hot temperatures. And um, again, surprisingly, there was, there was no strong evidence that frequency of collection was important, but you know, I need to caution you that we've only done three trials so far, and we, as we conduct more trials, we may start to see that the hourly collections, uh, in fact, do collect a few more crayfish. So that's, that's something we're gonna keep an eye on down the road. So uh, in conclusion then, Carbon dioxide can be used to remove invasive crayfish through emergence, but uh, a couple caveats need to be kept in mind. One is that this is most effective at hot temperatures, greater than 30 degrees Celsius. And in those cases, we were able to get 50% removal. At cooler temperatures, um, we recommend that emergence collection should be coupled with efficient collection of near shore crayfish and when we did this in our trials, we were able to get about 30 to 40% removal from those small ponds. Um, we do have evidence that CO2 is not effective if freshwater refuges are present. So this, in an invaded system, this could take the form of a seep or an underwater spring or inflows from, from, drain it, from drains or creeks coming into that infested water body. So um, this is something we're really interested in following up on. And again, we think we may be able to use that weakness as, as a strength. Uh, we did notice that the CO2 really seemed to induce crayfish to move to that freshwater refuge in the catch basin. And so one idea that we've been talking about now that we wanna kind of move forward with is to see whether it's more effective to use carbon dioxide to push crayfish to a refuge area rather than trying to get them to emerge from the pond. So the idea would be that in an infested pond, we would um, inject CO2 at one end of the pond and then keep moving that CO2 injection forward to drive all the crayfish to, to uh, concentrate at the far end of the pond where, this, where the CO2 uh, concentration is much lower. And the theory would be that this would make collection by seining or by trapping a lot more efficient. And this might be particularly effective in water bodies that have a freshwater inflow or seep that could, um, that could further enhance that, uh, that the, the ability um, of that to serve as a, as a refuge area. And so we think that this will be the focus of uh, future trials uh, coming up next year. And uh, with that, I will, uh, turn this over to Aaron and he's gonna talk about um, a trial we did up in Michigan to actually test this out in an infested water body. And okay, thank you very much, uh, Jim. So our final presenter today is Aaron Cup. Aaron is a research fish biologist at the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, Upper Midwest Environmental Science Center in La, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, Mr. Cup conducts research to determine the efficacy of aquatic invasive species control chemicals and aquaculture drugs to support registration with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, Mr. Cup has an MS in fisheries from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. And with that, I'll turn that over to Aaron. Can you guys hear me? Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, so I'll wrap things up and just 
uh, give an overview of a pilot study that we did this past year in Michigan. Um, I think we're okay on time, so we should have time for questions. Uh, otherwise, Greg can send out our contact information and um, feel free to send Annie, Jim, or myself an email and we'll get back to you. Uh, so for this field trial, I'd like to first acknowledge the project team. This is a collaborative effort uh, with lots of upfront communication. So a number of folks from USGS, both up here in La Crosse at UMass um, and down in Columbia at CERC, uh, also Michigan DNR, especially Seth Herbst and Sarah Thomas and their crews, uh, Michigan State University, Brian Roth and Kelly Smith, uh, and then Auburn University, Jim, Hesham, and Rebecca. Uh, had a role in coordinating this effort. <clears throat> so Annie and Jim did a good job uh, kind of showing the proof of concept studies at a small scale. CO2 can be applied into water to alter crayfish behavior, but really the rubber hits the road. How is that useful for management? So in a field setting, can we still use CO2 to push crayfish towards shore and can we use it to um, push crayfish onto land where they can be more easily captured. Uh, so this project is actually in support of Michigan DNR's Red Swamp Crayfish Response Plan. They've already moved, removed over 20,000 crayfish from I believe around 30 different infested sites. Um, and trapping alone really isn't going to be 100% successful uh, to support eradication. So there's a need for other control tools uh, that can be developed that can help supplement the ongoing trapping efforts uh, to control these relatively new uh, infestations in southeast Michigan. So we proposed carbon dioxide as one chemical option that really uh, didn't have the environmental concerns or uh, the extensive regulatory approvals uh, to go out and actually do some field testing. And I'm not going to cover it on this uh, Sorry, I should flip through the slides. Uh, I'm not gonna cover it on this presentation, but we've done a lot of work with carbon dioxide uh, and invasive carps. And it's actually to the point now where we've submitted a registration packet to EPA uh, for the registration of CO2 as an aquatic pesticide. Um, we hope to hear back over the next couple months. And if those labels are approved, CO2 could at that point be an approved pesticide, which could be applied similar to any other pesticide. So, for example, road known um, under its lab approved label use. <clears throat> uh, so for the field study, we had a pretty simple experimental design. We had proposed to treat three different ponds. Uh, the Sheridan Inn Pond, that was actually prioritized by Michigan DNR. So of the 20,000 crayfish that they had removed, over 80% came from the Sheridan Pond. So it did uh, we expected that to have the highest relative abundance of crayfish. Uh, and then we also wanted to treat the Holiday Inn ponds, which you can see. Uh, this is a pretty urban setting, so it, uh, each pond is named by what business it was closest to. But uh, uh, even the best uh, coordinated plans can fall apart due to Mother Nature. So the week before we went to do these treatments, uh, there was some substantial rainfall in Novi, Michigan. Uh, and both of the holiday imponds were flooded well over their banks. So um, we had to scrap those and we were down to just one treatment pond uh, at the Sheridan Inn. But we did a couple miles down the road, there was Fox Creek Golf Course. So we used those uh, two ponds on the golf course as our control ponds. So again, sometimes field research is a little bit opportunistic. Um, this wasn't a great statistical study design, but it did uh, support Michigan DNR's uh, management needs and kind of gave us a control or a comparison between the treated ponds and the untreated ponds. And similar to Jim's studies down at Auburn, there was a physical barrier or fencing put around all of these ponds. And we, we collected the same water quality and crayfish trapping data at the treatment and control ponds. So, Really, we were setting out to answer two research questions. First, uh, can we actually go out and administer CO2 at a relevant management scale? So the, the Sheridan Pond was about 2,500 cubic meters, so it was a large pond. Uh, and we knew from Jim's trials at Auburn, we needed to get over 200 milligrams per liter CO2 in the water uh, 
to elicit some sort of a behavioral response from the crayfish. Uh, and then second, we really needed to know, does this work in the field? So does elevated CO2 enhance red swamp crayfish removal? And we did that through two endpoints. So uh, MSU has their uh, baited traps they use in those ponds um, along the shorelines. And then we also, between the fencing, I'll show a figure a little bit later, um, use the on-land capture, so the emergence endpoint. So here's kind of a conceptual layout of the site. You can see where uh, the tanks were positioned. Uh, we injected CO2 from August 21st to August 24th in the Sheridan Pond. Um, we just used diffusers, so that's, uh, uh, you've seen them in aquaculture tanks and things like that, just bubbled in CO2 from the tanks. Um, and I guess to put some numbers to that, we estimated we put in about 10,000 pounds of CO2 uh, it's likely we put in less than that. It was warm while these trials were being conducted. Uh, and the tanks tend to lose pressure. There's pressure relief valves on those. Uh, so we didn't have a way to weigh the tanks, but our best estimate is we put in a little less than 10,000 pounds. Um, and the total cost for that product was around $5,400 uh, or 54 cents a pound or $818 per 100,000 gallons of of water treated. So here's what it looks like. Again, we're right outside the Sheridan Hotel. Uh, aside from a lot of our equipment, it was, it just looked like the pond was being aerated. Uh, you can see some of the bubbles uh, coming up to the surface. Uh, again, pretty urban setting. It's not uh, typically what you think of for fisheries or invasive species management, but uh, uh, it was convenient setting. The one funny event that happened during the treatments, uh, so the overnight crews, we had 24 hour shifts or overnight shifts. And uh, there was a, a police chase through the treatment area between the Sheridan uh, and the pond. And the suspect uh, had must have made it through and no, the crew didn't see him, but uh, the police officers stopped to find out uh, what we were doing and were so interested they uh, abandoned their their chase. So I just found that to be somewhat comical. So here's what the treatment looks like. So this is time series data of CO2 uh, concentrations in the pond collected before, during, and after the treatments. You can see from the yellow stars when we started and then stopped uh, CO2 injection. So there was a pretty abrupt rise in CO2 concentrations in the pond when we started injection. Uh, so about 11, 12 hours after we started, we did reach our target of 200 milligrams per liter. We were actually able to maintain that for almost three days uh, above 200 milligrams per liter with uh, a maximum of 351 milligrams per liter. Uh, and you can see the decline in CO2 after uh, injection stopped. Uh, so CO2 gas, it's held at, or it's at super saturated concentrations in the pond at this point. So it's not held under pressure. So over time, it just naturally uh, comes out of solution. We did have a lot of rain, uh, like I mentioned. So there was likely some dilution that was also occurring, but uh, with no artificial uh, post-treatment uh, measures, it did return back to baseline concentrations. Uh, the other parameter that's affected when you add CO2 to water is pH. So again, this is uh, pH over time in the Sheridan Pond. You can see when we started injection, there was about a two unit drop in pH, um, which the lowest we measured was about a pH of six. And if you look at CO2 buffering uh, equations, it, typically with what you can get into solution, they, it does buffer out around a pH of six. So it's, it's not like you would apply CO2 and cause a highly acidic uh, condition in a pond, which again, you can see after the treatment was turned off, did return back to normal. So now for the cool observation. So to be honest, at, 
before the treatment and on the first day of treatment, we, we, I don't think anyone on site saw a crayfish other than what was removed from the baited traps. Um, but then thinking back to CO2, by the second day we were well above our target and we did start to make some observations of crayfish climbing onto those freshwater inlets. So similar to what Jim mentioned, where they, they move towards the fresh water as an area of refuge. I, we think that's kind of what uh, was occurring here. So you can see they're right at the, the air water interface. I'm not sure if they were uh, breathing atmospheric air or if there was some sort of stratification of the treatment right at that uh, air water uh, area, so higher rates of gas exchange. Uh, but we saw this mostly in the mornings and you could walk up to the crayfish and they would scurry away and then within 10 to 30 seconds uh, they would return. So you could tell they didn't like uh, being in the pond and there was some effect of the treatment happening. But again, these were very few observations. We actually saw very few crayfish overall in the ponds. And then that third picture shows crayfish did eventually pass out. So this was on the third day. Um, the crayfish were alive, um, but they had completely lost equilibrium. And that's what it, that's an endpoint we were hoping to avoid because when you cause crayfish to pass out at that point, they aren't vulnerable to baited trapping, uh, and they definitely can't emerge. So. Uh, not an endpoint for removal that we were targeting, potentially for a lethal application, but uh, that wasn't the focus of this trial. So here's a video, and I don't know how, it will, how well it will broadcast. Um, so it's pretty poor quality. I just took it with my cell phone. But you can see the crayfish in the pond that had uh, essentially passed out, narcotized, uh, that are definitely alive, but they have just they lost their ability uh, to move around and that when you picked them up, their defense mechanisms were completely gone. So, so the CO2 had definitely taken a, a physiological toll on those crayfish. Uh, the other thing we observed were, was the effect on fish. So these are water retention ponds. They really just uh, collect rainwater and runoff. Um, they aren't fish ponds, but like a lot of places, fatted minnows had made their way in there. Um, and as soon as we turned on CO2 uh, that same day, the, all, all the fathead minnows in the pond, there were three freshwater inlets. Um, and it's hard to see in that picture, but they they huddled around the freshwater inlets uh, as refuge. So, I mean, it was just a complete blackout in those areas with thousands and thousands of crayfish. Um, and the other thing, Michigan DNR had put some channel catfish in the pond. They weren't sure if they survived, but uh, by the second day, we did start to see uh, channel catfish coming up to the surface. So uh, we captured those. It, Brian Roth took those back to MSU and they inspected the gut, hoping to see red swamp crayfish, but it was uh, uh, just full of fathead minnows. So it's likely that uh, fathead minnows were the preferred food source um, and they weren't heavily consuming the red swamp crayfish of the pond. So putting some numbers to the um, the visual observations, we, we think there was an effect on uh, crayfish behavior, but we evaluated that through standardized uh, sampling methods. So uh, similar to Jim, there's a physical barrier put around all of the ponds. Um, and then every one to three hours, the, the crews would go out and do surveys. So they'd collect any crayfish that they found and record the location that they found those crayfish. Um, whether they were outside the fence, inside the fence, under the shade cloth, uh, or in the water. So anything in the water was gigged because they were a little bit difficult to capture. Um, but again, very similar methods to uh, Jim's study down at Auburn. So here's some results that Brian Roth sent me this week uh, from the CO2 treatment. This uh, table shows the treatment pond at the Sheridan Inn 
and then the two control ponds. And these are total crayfish captured at those four locations that I showed. Again, these aren't uh, normalized per effort uh, or anything like that. It's just total amount caught. So, you know, overall, the big picture is there were very few caught, but in the, the Sheridan, it, it is a little bit encouraging that uh, more crayfish were caught uh, near shore or on shore relative to the control ponds. And again, these are preliminary data. We'll dig a little bit further into these. Um, won't be able to make statistical comparisons likely, but uh, if we can uh, try to tease out what we thought happened uh, during these, or during this injection. Uh, so Sarah Thomas from Michigan DNR just sent me this figure and this may explain why our catch rates were so low. So MSU and MDNR have long-term trapping removal efforts as part of that response plan. Um, if you look at the catch per effort uh, leading up to the treatment period, which is shown in the box, there was a pretty drastic decline in catch rates over time. Um, and actually when we conducted our treatment period um, or our CO2 treatment, uh, catch rates were the lowest for that that season. So, you know, it's possible it could be a temperature thing as Jim alluded to with his uh, pond trials or uh, potentially uh, linked to us reproduction. Uh, but we did, you know, the timing of this, it came together pretty quick. So uh, as soon as we got results that we could uh, use for the concentrations of the treatments, uh, we went out and, and conducted the application. So I think just lesson learned, maybe doing the treatments earlier in the year uh, could have a better end point. So again, everything's preliminary, but I think if we circle back to the research questions, we can say, yes, we successfully administered the treatment at a, a management scale. So we hit our target of 200 milligrams per liter and we were able to maintain it for almost three days. Um, you know, did it work? Well, the visual observations, we think there was an effect on the behavior, but uh, Really, when you put the numbers to it, we have such low sample sizes and limited replicates. It's going to be tough with this pilot trial to make any strong conclusions. And again, if we'd have done it earlier, maybe in July, we could have uh, potentially had a better endpoint. Um, and we also didn't evaluate mortality with this study, but those narcotized crayfish, it's, it's really unknown if they recovered. So that's potentially an area we could look at for future research. Um, but again, when you try things in the field, you, especially for the first time, you learn a lot. So uh, the fence installation and just doing the, the surveys to collect crayfish were pretty labor intensive. Um, but that could potentially be overcome by pushing crayfish, as Jim mentioned, uh, which you could use a lower CO2 concentration, uh, which would also likely save uh, on product costs. Um, because again, those narcotized crayfish at the concentrations we use weren't vulnerable to uh, capture. Uh, in the freshwater inflow, so we had a lot of rain leading up to that study and there was, uh, we didn't quantify it, but there was water running into that pond. And based on how the fish responded and where we observed uh, crayfish, we think that they moved to those areas. So that could be I'm mean, useful potentially for multiple things. So if, if crayfish, uh, congregate in those areas. It could potentially be a useful for a targeted trapping effort. Um, if future piscicides or toxicants are developed, um, you potentially treat a smaller area of the pond because we know that's where you'd be most effective and potentially reduce uh, non-target exposure. Uh, or if we really want to do CO2, CO2 treatments again, we could uh, we know that we need to focus our gas injection in those areas to try to decrease that heterogeneity of the treatments. Uh, and then just some final thoughts. Uh, you know, this was a chemical control that really the endpoint was focused on helping uh, with management goals. So Michigan DNR is, is focused on eradication and they have that response plan in place. Um, 
you know, taking it from a small scale in a lab to a medium scale in the ponds at Auburn, then ultimately in a field was a, a nice stepwise approach. Um, one step kind of informing the next. And then I know Annie showed that flow diagram from before. Um, but I, each step kind of feeds into the next one. And re the communication between research and man management was critical for this project. Um, uh, it, was a, it was a lot of effort to do the field work and it happened pretty quickly. Um, it's from how we're going to deploy, uh, what we're going to learn from this, and then uh, some of the on the fly decisions that were made. And then final thing is just, it was great uh, that Michigan was willing to try something new. So, you know, research really kind of gets a bad rap when it's hung up in lab and in ponds and it doesn't uh, result in an applicable tool uh, for management. But in this case, uh, the communication between the research and the management and the willingness to go out and actually try something in the field um, was useful and I think we learned quite a bit. So with that, I will take any questions and looks like we're almost at 11, but uh, I, I can definitely stay late or again, Greg can send uh, our emails out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, yeah, so we, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them into the webinar chat function. Um, so you should be able to find that at the bottom of your screen or in the <laughs> Uh, we haven't seen anyone submit any um, questions as of yet, so uh, I guess maybe uh, ask a general question to the whole panel is, uh, given what was presented today, what would be the next thing as a group you'd like to see uh, happen in control? <laughs> That's the tough part about asking this to three different people. Nobody wants to answer it, I think. But uh, I know from from our end down here, um, what you know, we would like to start conducting some pond trials to look at, to try to test out that push idea that we've all been talking about. So that's that's one thing. Um, another issue is that you know, as Aaron showed in one of his results, there were a lot of burrows around those ponds. And those likely, we don't know if they were, how many were there before the treatment and how many, you know, broke after the treatment, but definitely starting to look at some control techniques for crayfish that have come out of the ponds and are now in burrows are, it's going to be a big next step. Um, so that's, that's from our end. And I think Annie, oh yeah. And then also looking at um, day versus night uh, capture rates might be a good thing. Um, and Annie, you're, I'm sure you have a lot of follow-up experiments as well with your toxicology work that you're doing. Yeah, uh, Jim and I are going to have a discussion over the winter to design um, our artificial burrow um, projects. Wisconsin uh, DNR has done some work with pesticide application onto soils. Um, as I mentioned, demonstrated efficacy but not within burrows. So we're gonna just have to see how to apply the chemical, whether we need to get it into their uh, burrow chambers down in the water that they use. Um, but apparently just applying it to the external uh, or the, um, the tunnel down to that cavity is, is not Uh, allowing the pesticide by the crayfish. That'll go on. And then we'll also, uh, we're also trying to uh, design a project to look at a treatment of one, two, three, four ponds in the late spring, hopefully after emergence of uh, young of the year from the, the burrows, <coughs> open water populations, where we um, dose uh, a retention pond with uh, one, chemical, hopefully we could do trials with both the chemicals and then look at um, mortality within ponds over 24 hours with emergence of crayfish from the ponds 
but also include cage studies so we can look at 24-hour lethal concentrations and then look at persistence of the chemical through time with additional 24-hour bioassays running up to as long as three months if necessary. So uh, we're working with the state DNR and um, EPA possibly to uh, permit that chemical application, but we're optimistic that, that it'll, it'll be done. Um, so, so Bob Kalala has, has a question um, as to whether the crayfish were primarily driven by uh, carbon dioxide or a lower pH. And I think that's a great question. I think we don't really know the answer to that because both of those go hand in hand. So we, um, we see both at the same time. So in our trials, our waters are a lot less alkaline than those up in Michigan. So the, the carbon dioxide, uh, even at the same level, will drive the pH. We saw it go down a little bit lower than what Aaron saw up in Michigan. So uh, that may be something to take into consideration as well. But uh, with CO2 injection, you know, as Aaron said, there, there will always be a uh, lower pH. Um, yeah, Bob just had another good comment. It might be cheaper to just lower the pH. So um, it's actually a good idea. That might be something to look into because uh, uh, we could can't separate out the CO2 from the pH, but we can separate the pH from the CO2, I guess. So those, that would be, uh, those might be some interesting trials to do as well. Um, there was also a question as to whether the carbon dioxide killed all the fish. Aaron, uh, I guess you, you're best, the best one to answer that question. Uh, well, you know, it killed most of the fish. I don't know that there was a complete eradication, but uh, uh, there was, the fatheads eventually did die, uh, quite a few anyways, uh, which is what we expected. So there's been some work, well, actually work that we've done that looked at CO2 as a lethal control or as a piscicide for uh, nuisance fishes. So going into this, we knew the concentrations we used would, would have an impact on fish. Um, but again, these weren't necessarily fish ponds or water retention ponds. So it, it wasn't uh, as big of a concern, but we did have a plan for um, capture of those fish and removal. So they, there wasn't an unsightly amount of fish in that pond at the end. So. I ended up with one question from uh, Eric Larson um, writes, any sense of what young of the year or juvenile crayfish are doing in response to CO2? Um, I think Brian Ross data does have size di distributions of crayfish that were collected. Um, the laboratory studies didn't test young of the year or, or ju uh, juvenile crayfish. I suspect that they're a more sensitive life stage. Um, and uh, the concern that Jim had about them migrating off-site might be an issue. But uh, without any data, I'm not sure we can adequately respond to that question. Yeah, we, we collected size data as well, and we're, we're still in the process of analyzing that. Um, we, we had a pretty wide size range in our pond trials, but um, Eric, I'm not sure how small. So we had some crayfish that were probably young of year, but we didn't get down into the really, you know, tiny, like new uh, juvenile stages that would have been newly emerged from burrows. Um, so it, you know, that would be something I think that would be important to look into in the future is to do some trials focused on some of those really early juvenile stages. Yeah, and you know, we don't know much about the life history of these crayfish in Michigan. And although we would probably want to um, treat open water after emergence with say the formulations of pyrethroids or pyrethrins, it may be much more effective to treat with dry ice before emergence in those burrows. So um, getting some of that life history information is critical to uh, applying these chemical tools. We have uh, a question for Jim and Aaron um, from Kyle Mosel. 
Um, Jim and Aaron, I really like the push idea of refuge areas. The refuge areas may already be in place or could also be artificially created. Um, maybe the refuge areas could be lined with some type of lift net. Question? Yeah, I think that's a, a great idea, Kyle. And we did try to sample uh, just seining around the freshwater inlets or kind of culverts in that pond. They didn't, didn't have a good picture in there, but uh, it wasn't a very effective way to try to sample. So like I mentioned, a, a targeted uh, trapping approach potentially or some type of a lift net would be a great idea in those areas because it definitely seemed uh, like that's where the fish and that's where the, uh, the crayfish probably ended up. I, I see a, a note here too that um, LSU has data on killing crayfish in burrows. So, um, man, we're we're all about looking at any information we can. So, if uh, somebody could send me the contact of, you know, who's working on that issue at LSU, or if there's any pubs, that would be great. Um, well, I think we, we're over time and we've got some really good questions and some good discussions. Um, so I'm going to call it a webinar. Uh, so thank you all for your participation and your attendance. And this has been really great. Um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to email me or uh, Aaron or Jim or Anne. So all right, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.